This is Ken McDermott Rowe. Welcome to History Counts. Forty years ago, an American naval vessel, the USS Liberty, was the victim of an unprovoked and savage attack by a foreign country while it was stationed in the Mediterranean Sea. Today's guest, retired naval officer James Ennis, was an eyewitness to the attack. We'll talk about the bloody details of the attack, and we'll talk about the events that followed, described by a top U.S. admiral as, quote, an official cover-up without precedent in American naval history. We'll be back with our guest, James Ennis, after this short break. Our guest today is James Ennis, author of Assault on the Liberty, which recounts the devastating attack on the United States Navy ship, the Liberty, during the Six-Day War. Mr. Ennis, a retired U.S. Naval officer, was serving as a lieutenant on the USS Liberty at the time of the attack. He's also one of the creators of the USS Liberty Memorial website, located at USSLiberty.org. Mr. Ennis, thanks very much for being with us today. You're welcome. It's my pleasure. Uh, Mr. Ennis, for those who aren't familiar with this attack, uh, if you could put it in some context for us by telling us first when it occurred and where was the Liberty at the time of the attack. This was on June 8, 1967, just a bit over 40 years ago, in the eastern Mediterranean uh, along the Gaza Strip, which uh, was the border between Israel and Egypt. We were sent out there. Uh, we were in t an intelligence ship. And we were sent out there to collect radio signals, uh, actually primarily of the Soviets that were in the area. And I was off to the deck on the ship that morning, 7 o'clock until noon. And uh, so I brought the ship to the coast and at about 12 miles from the coast, right parallel the course, slowed the ship to five knots. We just proceeded down the coast. What, what was going on at the war at that time? The war had begun a few days before the attack on, on 5 June, correct? That's right. So this was the fourth day of the war. Quiet. We knew that over the mountains there was uh, some shooting going on, but uh, where we were was quite peaceful. The visibility was unlimited. Uh, high in the sky, airplanes were flying over apparently toward the war. And Israel had been successful at that point in the war? Oh, very much. In the first 30 minutes or so of the war, which was initiated by the Israelis, the Israelis, uh, with a surprise attack, uh, destroyed just about every Arab airplane uh, in the Middle East, so that there was almost no opposition by the time we arrived four days later. They had attacked Egypt, Syria, Jordan, all suddenly and by surprise? Yes. Nasser had been making some noises on the coast, but he had no intention of, of invading, but being very bellicose. And Israelis have admitted since then that they knew he was not going to attack, and they used that as an excuse to uh, capture more Arab land. So uh, that was what was going on, and they didn't want the United States to know of their plans. They had a particular plan that actually was an attack that was going to go on the morning of, of 8 June, isn't that correct? They planned to invade the Golan Heights and capture the Golan from Syria on the 8th of June. And this was not anticipated by the international community? This would have been a, a surprise? It was feared. I, I talked to Secretary of State Dean Rusk afterward, and he, when my book was published, and he told me that uh, they were afraid that Israel was going to do that, and they were trying to persuade them to hold back. Uh, Rusk said he stayed on the phone with the Israelis all night, uh, urging them to keep their forces where they were and not to escalate the war because they were afraid the Russians would get into it. So the U.S. was neutral in this war? Officially, we were, we were neutral. We appeared to be siding more with the Israelis than anything else, but we weren't taking a, an active role in this shooting. And the Liberty was in, interna in international waters at the time? It was. We were just past the 12-mile limit, which the Egyptians claimed as their territorial waters. Israel, I think, claimed three, or perhaps it was the other way. But we made a point to stay uh, just beyond the 12-mile limit, uh, where we wouldn't be seen by either side as within their territorial waters. Well, now, as you said, you were coming on deck for the 0800 watch, and this is in military time. It'd be for civilians 8 o'clock in the morning. You came on a little early, as I, I note from your book. And what was the situation uh, on the ship at that time? I Actually, I 
it was the custom to relieve the watch closer to 7 or 7.15 just so that the off-going watch could have breakfast. I was offshore the deck from 7.15 or so until 12. This situation was quite calm. We had, uh, it was since it was a bright sunny day uh, and there was no sign of hostilities near us, uh, we had men who were off duty sunbathing on deck. It was pretty relaxed. And uh, around 11 o'clock, uh, suddenly there was a puff of smoke on the on the coast. Uh, we didn't know what that was, but uh, thick black smoke uh, coursed down the coast in the wind. So we learned much later that that was an ammunition dump that had blown up. But it really had nothing to do with us. The officer you were relieving mentioned that you had some uh, aircraft visiting you b uh, before you came up. We did. Before I came on watch, uh, around 6 o'clock, there was an Israeli, a slow Israeli reconnaissance plane that circled us. As soon as I took the watch, uh, another airplane circled us. And then every 45 minutes all morning, uh, about every 45 minutes, an Israeli a uh, recon plane or a pair of jet aircraft would come out and circle us two or three times. Did you believe that those aircraft could identify the ship and its country? We knew they did because, uh, remember, we were an intercept ship, and we had 100 men down below who were uh, with earphones listening to radios, and they heard these uh, jet pilots uh, and the recon pilots as they circled us, each time they would radio their headquarters and say, we are circling in a, a ship with an American flag and men sunbathing on deck. So it was very clear that, that they knew who we were that, uh, and their headquarters knew who we were. In fact, the flag was significant. You caused it to be changed. We had replaced. been steaming across the Mediterranean at high speed at 17, 18 knots for nearly a week, and the flag uh, had gotten dirty from smoke and tattered from the wind. So the first thing I did when I took the watch at 7 o'clock was to order that flag replaced. The uh, signalman quartermaster protested because he said, that's my last flag. I don't have any more clean flags. And I told him, I don't care. We are going to show our brightest, cleanest colors in here so that these planes circling us know exactly who we were. I was relieved at 12, uh, but I came back at 1 o'clock for general quarters. So uh, I came on this time as junior officer of the deck. Well, another officer was at OD, but I still had the con. I means I was driving. So you were, a, you were a naval lieutenant, which would be, for those who don't know, Navy rank would be comparable to an Army captain. So you'd be, you were just one grade below the executive officer, uh, Lieutenant Commander uh, Phil Armstrong? That's right. So you were on the bridge? I was on, I was on the bridge uh, again from 1 o'clock until 2 o'clock. So I, at that point, I was junior officer of the deck, and I was still driving. During the morning, I was usually the only officer on the bridge. But for general quarters, the captain and several other officers were there for that occasion. We finally uh, we finished our general quarters drill at just before 2, and suddenly, as I was being relieved, radar picked up three very fast boats approaching the ship, just coming over the horizon 15 miles away. And uh, immediately... Over the top of the boats, we picked up three jet aircraft approaching the ship. Uh, I was just being relieved, uh, and I went with the ship's photographer up to the next deck, the fourth deck of the ship, to try to take some pictures of these approaching jets. Uh, was, we had been, as I said, circled all day, and these were more, appeared to be more of the same. So uh, I went up on the 04 level, and along the starboard side of the ship, that's the right side, I could see... Uh, these jets passing down the side. They turned left and made a big 180-degree left circle and came straight down the center line, straight at us. The um, photographer with, his, with a Nikon and a long lens on it was watching them through the lens, taking pictures, and suddenly they started firing. We had men in all four gun mounts. Uh, there were just 50 caliber machine gun mounts. But from where I stood on the 04 level, I could see the direct hits to all the gun mounts as men were just blown literally high into the air from the explosions. And, uh, and then the first airplane passed overhead, and I looked out, and 